WROW, Albany, New York. Johnny Deller. This is Frank Harmon, Johnny, at Tri-Western Life here in Hartford. Hi, Frankie. Where have you been, anyway? Oh, I just got back from Lake Tahoe out on the West Coast. Well, then it's no wonder Jack Price couldn't get hold of you. Price in your office down in Corpus Christi? That's right. He called and told me he'd been trying to get you on the phone for several days. Oh, well, I'm sorry. He has a problem, a pretty big one. When he couldn't reach you, he sent it on. He sent her on to us. It? Her? Which is it? Both. So come on over here, will you? There's no time to waste. Oh, what's it all about? Well, all I can tell you is... Well, somehow, you've got to prevent a murder. CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New England office of Tri-Western Life Insurance Company. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the unworthy kin matter. After the Lake Tahoe mess, I was ready for a nice long rest. But a job's a job. So expense account item one, $1.10 for a cab back to Frank Harmon's office at Tri-Western in the big new building on the square. Glad you finally got back here, Johnny. Hiya, Frankie. Yeah, sit down. I'll get right to the point. Okay. I'll try to give you the whole story before she gets here. Oh, she? Name is Jean Unworthy. Unworthy? That's right. <laughs> That's a funny one. Well, our little problem isn't very funny. Now, listen. I'm listening. About four, maybe five years ago, up in Hypsilanti, Michigan, a prominent businessman was killed by a guy named Eric Bean. Oh, you're telling me. It was a ruthless, pointless, wanton murder simply because the victim refused to give him a few bucks. And the defense tried to get Bean out of it on grounds of temporary insanity. Yeah, that's right. But instead, they sent him up to the Michigan State Prison, gave him life with no chance of parole. Oh, yeah, I remember. It just happens I was in on that case. Hmm? Oh, of course. Of course you were. Well, all right, then. Well, I didn't play a very important part in it, I have to admit, but I was there. And you were there during his trial. From the first to the last gavel. Yeah, and you know what Eric Bean did when the judge pronounced sentence on him. Yeah, that's right. Because it could be that Bean thought his remarks were partly aimed at me. I mean, there's talk about getting even with him. All right, sure. Sure, I'll go up to your lousy, stinking prison. Order! Order in the court! But if you think you can keep me in it, you're crazy. Order! Order! Will someone restrain the prisoner? Because I'm going to get out. I do, I'm going to kill everybody that had anything to do with killing me up. Officer, restrain that man. No, don't take your hands off. Order. 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 Yeah. Yeah, Frankie, it was the typical threat of a tough criminal to get out someday and get even with everybody. By killing them. That's what he said. Mm. Including you? Well, I told you I really didn't have too much to do with the case. So there's no real reason for Bean to hold a grudge against me. Was there any real reason for the murder? Well, no. But listen, you know how little those courtroom threats usually mean. Yeah, well, then you're not at all worried over the fact that Eric Bean escaped seven or eight days ago. Oh? Well? Mm, no, not particularly. Well, you should be, Johnny. Along with the rest of the people who were involved in that affair. Oh, Frankie, I told Johnny, you... Johnny, in the past five days... Bean has killed four of the people he promised to kill. No kidding. And the police have no idea where he is or when he'll strike again. Hmm. And another one of his intended victims is Mr. Albert K. Unworthy, who's now living down in Corpus Christi, Texas. And he's insured by our company for over half a million dollars. Well? Hmm, yeah. That reminds me of a tip I've been meaning to give you. Whenever you buy Pepsi-Cola, get an extra carton. This is the secret of effortless entertaining. You know by now that as the parties go, so goes the Pepsi. So face reality 
and be ready for any number of thirsts by making sure there's always plenty of the light refreshment on hand. People go for Pepsi because it refreshes without filling and does it in such a good tasting way. Come to think of it, why not buy a case of Pepsi? Then maybe there'll be enough for you to have some too. Be sociable, look smart, keep up to date with Pepsi. Drink light, refreshing Pepsi. Stay young and fair and debonair. Be sociable, have a Pepsi. And now act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Right now, Johnny, when Jack Price wasn't able to reach you, he dumped the whole thing in my lap, including the old man's daughter, Jean. She arrived here in Hartford early this morning, came in here, and demanded that you be appointed a bodyguard for her father. Oh, now listen, Frank. I phoned her at her hotel right after I got in touch with you. She's probably on her way over here to see you right now. Hey, look, Frank, I'm an investigator, not a body... Listen, buddy, buddy. Are you forgetting Eric Bean may have you high on his list, too? So what? So what? If I keep my eyes open, my, my manners and my... Oh, I see. What? Yeah, put two of Eric Bean's intended victims together. Give him a wide-open chance to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, and he's almost bound to show. Yeah, so the cops who've been standing by pick him up along with our two bodies. And the company has done a great public service. Hooray. No, that wasn't what I was thinking of at all. Frank, I couldn't go down there to Corpus Christi right away anyway. Why not? First thing tomorrow morning, I have an appointment in New York with an attorney for a deposition in that Lake Tahoe case I just wound up. Well, so you lose a few hours. And what's more, I hate those bodyguard assignments, and you know it. But when such an important client's involved, Johnny... Well, there's nothing but a lot of trouble with an A number one chance of getting shot in the back. Yeah, but don't you see... No, no, Frank, I'm sorry. If unworthy wants protection, let him call in the police. They have a very good force there in Corpus Christi. Johnny. And when this dame, this, this daughter gets here, well, simply tell her I don't want the case. And I mean it, Frank. That's final. That is unequivocally and irrevocably and absolute... Mr. Harmon? Oh, Miss Unworthy. Oh, please come in. Ah. Thank you. Yes. Come in and meet Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Suddenly, I changed my mind. Even as that whole office suddenly seemed to change and take on a strange and wonderful glow. She was, so help me, one of the most beautiful girls I've ever seen. Tall, but not too tall. With honey-colored hair and a complexion that... and a figure that... and a twinkle in those baby blue eyes that... Oh, what's the use? The right words simply aren't. Not to describe this one. Wow. Well, uh... <clears throat> oh, so sit down, please, Miss Hunter. Oh, thank you, Frank. But I told you this morning to please call me Jean. Oh, yes, of course. I forgot. And that goes for you, too, Johnny Dollar. Oh, uh, sure, uh, Jean, I, uh... <laughs> sure. Can you leave with me right away, Johnny? I mean, for Corpus Christi? I hope you told him how urgent this is, Frankie. Well, yes, I did. Then well, you will come and watch over Daddy until they catch this murderer, won't you, John? Well, now, Jean... Yes? Well, I... That is, I... Yes? Johnny? Well, I have to be in New York first thing in the morning to see an attorney. Oh, well, that's just fine, then. Because I have an early morning date in New York with Madame Algamarino before I go on back home. Oh? You know who she is? Oh, well, uh, sure, I've heard of her, but I, I, I never thought anybody in the world actually had enough money to buy those clothes, those gowns that she designed. Oh, now you're kidding me, aren't well, you? Yeah. But I just love having her things. Oodles and oodles of them. Uh -huh. So we'll go down to New York tonight. I'll be staying at the Pierre, so you stay at the Pierre. And we'll have a ball. We'll really do the town. Oh, I just love New York. Well, now, then I... And tomorrow morning, while I'm getting some dresses and things... You can see your lawyer, and then we'll take off for Corpus Christi together. Jean. But come on, hon. We'll have to hurry if we want to make the four o'clock plane to New York. Well, uh... And Frank, dear, thanks so much for finding Johnny. I feel better. I feel that Daddy's safer already. Expense account item two, twenty-one fifty for a cab and plane tickets to New York for the two of us. 
With this charmer in tow, well, believe me, it wasn't easy. But I realized that with an important assignment on my hands, I better play it safe and behave myself. So, down in New York, item three is 9.50 for a taxi to the Pierre, where I dropped her off. Then to the Gotham, where I got myself a room. That evening, the tab for cocktails and dinner at the Pavillon, no less, came to $58. And I was pretty impressed by the maitre d's immediate recognition of her. And his disappointment at the smallness of the bill she'd run up. Oh, and uh, tips, by the way, came to $14 more. Then the evening really got underway via the nightclub route. And I mean only the most expensive nightclubs. Where again she was recognized by all the maitre d's. And the total bill by the time I dropped her off at the Pierre shortly after 4 a.m., only $130, including tips and taxis, of course. I hope my deposition the next morning in the attorney's office made some sense because I was bushed. But then, after leaving him on the way back to my hotel, I picked up a newspaper. And I nearly blew my top. Item five, six, whatever it is, 85 cents for a call to Frank Harmon back in Hartford. Now, now, Johnny. And it was you who gave that story to the wire services about my going down to Corpus Christi to save the life of dear old Albert Unworthy. But, Johnny, you yourself suggested it might help to flush out this killer. Oh, yeah, sure. Make it easy for him. Get two of us in one trip. Thank you very much. <laughs> Item 7, 287, 50 plane fare, tips and incidentals for the flight to Corpus Christi. And by the time we got there... Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to say it. But, uh, well, that, that genie is not only the most beautiful, the most charming. Well, put it this way. By the time that flight was over, if Jean had said, come on, Johnny, let's get married, I think I might have taken the leap without one single thought about the consequences. And after we landed and she stepped into a phone booth to call and make sure her father was still all right... Well, I was almost annoyed at the sudden appearance of an old pal of mine, Doug Johnstone, kid brother of Jack, who dramatizes these radio cases of mine. How'd I know you were coming down here with well, Johnny? It's all over the papers. Yeah, I was afraid of that. Oh? Yeah. But uh, how are you anyway, Doug? Oh, I couldn't be better. Hey, uh, hey, boy, you certainly pick them, don't you? Uh, what do you mean? Your, uh, traveling companion, Gene Unworthy. Oh, yeah. What do you know about her father, Doug? Well, I kind of thought you might want a little help while you're down here. That's why I came to meet you. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, now, uh, here's what we ought to do. You, uh, put her in a taxi. Her home isn't far from here. Then you and I will run on down to my office and talk a while, and I'll drive you out to their place later. Uh, well, now, wait, Doug. I think that's a very good idea. Oh, Jeannie, uh, this is an old friend of mine, Doug Johnstone. Hi, Doug. Jean, uh, I've uh, always looked forward to meeting you. Well, how nice. And my, I'm meeting more good-looking men these days. Johnny, Doug's right. See, it'll give me a chance to kind of freshen up and prepare the royal welcome for you here in Corpus Christi, all right? Well, I uh, kind of so hate to have you... So you go ahead with Doug, and I'll see you at the house later. Taxi! Taxi! Huh? Okay, Doug, let's go. Okay, now, Doug, as you were saying. As I was saying, well, sit down. Make yourself comfortable first, oh, General. Thanks. Well? Well, Johnny, old man Unworthy is loaded, all right. Despite this gorgeous daughter of his trying to spend it all. But when she turns on the charm... Oh, you are telling me. Always a sucker for a good-looking gal, ain't you, Johnny? Oh, now, Mr. Johnstone saw... Oh, sure, that, uh... Jean is different. The point is... Oh, she sure is. The <laughs> point is, though, that there may be something in the rumor that her old man is getting a mite fed up with some of her extravagant... Uh, uh, Johnny, Johnny, hand me the phone, will you? Well, what's the matter? You think I don't make a good secretary? Oh, this here is Mr. Douglas D. Johnson's office. And... help. Quick. She? Yes. He's here. That killer. What? He's here in the house, and he's going to shoot Daddy with a... No! No, please! <laughs> Throwing a house party every weekday is no small accomplishment. Ask any housewife who's faced the perils of just one house party with fear and trepidation. But Art Linkletter's been at it so long that he never worries today about tomorrow's house party. And yet they always come out slick, smooth, and hilarious. Art's enthusiasm is part of the reason why. 
The way he lets his guests take the bit in their teeth is another. So you never know where the fun's going to lead once it starts. Listen Monday through Friday on CBS Radio. Now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Unworthy Kin Matter. Doug Johnstone and I tore out to the house, and yeah, Mr. Albert K. Unworthy was dead all right. Three neat, clean bullet holes in his temple. His daughter, Jean, was a, a wreck. One sleeve of her dress was torn. There was a red weld on her cheek where she'd apparently been struck by the killer. Oh, Johnny. Johnny. Oh, all right, now, easy. It was so terrible. So awful. So terrible. It's okay, now, honey. Just try to take it easy and remember exactly what happened. Why did it have to happen to him? It was so good. So wonderful to me ever since the day that he adopted me, and now he's... I take it easy. Now, who else was in here, Jean? Were you in here with your father alone? Yes. Yes, Johnny. I don't know where the servants are. Daddy must have let them take the day off. Or... But this man... Then this horrible-looking man came in. And... Can you tell me what he looked like? Oh, I don't know. I saw him only a few seconds. He was short. And he was heavy... Heavy set. And that thick... Black, curly hair that came down to a point on his forehead. Yeah, yeah. Go on, Jean. That strange, pale uh, pallor. His face was almost gray. After seven years in the clink. And one of his ears, it was kind of mashed like, like a piece of cauliflower. There was a dirty scar, too, on, on his hand when he held that pistol on poor Daddy. Oh, Johnny... And his height, his weight. Have you any idea? Oh, I don't know. He was maybe, maybe five feet seven or eight. And he was heavy. Maybe 180 pounds or something. He was stocky. You ask me, that fits the newspaper description of Eric Bean almost to a T, gentlemen. Had you ever seen Eric Bean before, Jean? No. No, Johnny. And there was that wild animal look in his eyes. And he came rushing in here with that gun, and I tried to call you, but he he knocked me down, and he... And then he... I guess I passed out. What is it? Oh, Johnny, please help me. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. You want to call the police, Doug? Sure. Doug not only called the police, but the family doctor... And after Jean had given the police all the information she could, the doctor gave her a mild sedative and sent her up to bed. By that time, Jean's personal maid had come in, so after assuring her we'd do everything we could. Johnny. Johnny, dear, don't you see? Now you may be in danger from... Oh, dear. I guess whatever the doctor gave me, I... I can't stay awake. Come back, dear. Come back. Uh... On the way back to Doug's office, neither of us said a word. Not until we got inside and he closed the door. And even then we sat there quietly for a minute. Well, um, Johnny, you, uh, like a little drink? Uh, No. Thanks. You have one. No. You, uh... No. N nothing, uh, I just... Johnny, you're thinking the same thing I am. Yeah, Doug, I guess I am. Mind if I use your phone? My call was to the police, not there in Corpus Christi, but in Ypsilanti, Michigan. It's item 8440. I got hold of Sergeant Tim Brower, the man who'd originally arrested Eric Bean, who now again was working on the case. What do you mean, am I afraid of him? Are you Dollar? Well, I, I expect I ought to keep an eye out for him. Why? You'd be a way down on this list. Like maybe Mr. Albert Unworthy and... Uh... Yeah, like Unworthy and Phillips and Mrs. Peterson and half a dozen others. The only ones he's trying to knock off now are the people whose testimony really set him up. But we'll get him before he does. Because he's just crazy enough to have set himself a very obvious little pattern in these four new murders. Yeah, what kind of a pattern, Sergeant? 
And all the people around here, and in the order of their importance in the case. Oh? First was the judge, Judge uh, Henry Packham, who actually set the sentence. Okay, Sergeant. And the chief prosecutor, Mr. Frederick Wall. Okay, Sergeant, that's all I need to know. Then there was... Huh? Well, Johnny? Yeah, well, I, I guess you tipped me off, Doug, when you said something about her father getting fed up with her extravagance. Her foster father? Oh, yeah, she told us that herself, uh, adopted. There was no real blood bond between them. Mm. So, I, I suppose it's no wonder she was taking him for all she could. And when she found he was going to pull back on the reins. Well, I'm afraid her description of Bean is what stopped me. Too perfect. Mm. I mean, when a man suddenly barges in, knocks her down, and fire. Fires. Yeah. Three bullets into his skull. But when she said he was going to kill him, and we heard only two shots. Only two, Doggy. Yeah. Johnny, you want me to go along with you? Just, uh. Let me use your car. Sure. You mean you found the murderer, Johnny? Yeah, Jeannie. And all the proof I need. Oh, thank goodness. And did you kill him when you found him? Kill? Yes. Him? What? Only one more thing I'd like to know. Yes. Well, what is it, Johnny? What you did with the gun. Oh. Well? It's... Out in the little fish pond. Under the library when... Johnny. Johnny, not a chance for me. Not a chance. And I learned about women from her. Following Eric Bean's pattern, the police in Michigan were able to pick him up in less than two weeks before he could kill again. The expense account, the total, call it $500 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Constipation is something people don't talk about much, but it can be a problem for anyone, even doctors. And when constipation occurs, it's interesting to see just what doctors consider important about a laxative they might use or recommend. Well, a majority of the doctors we heard from had this to say. A laxative should be effective, gentle, close to natural acting. A medicine that can be used with complete confidence. Now, Exlax has been popular with many doctors and millions of people over the years because pleasant tasting chocolated Exlax is effective. Overnight, it helps you toward your normal regularity. Exlax is so gentle, so close to natural acting, there's no upset. That's why many doctors and millions of people use Exlax with complete confidence. Exlax, the laxative that helps you toward your normal regularity gently overnight. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the what goes matter is just what it sounds like, a real puzzler. So join us, won't you? Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Dick Crenna, Frank Gerstle, Russell Thorson, Stacey Harris, James McCallion, Bill James, and Gus Bays. This is John Wall speaking. Next, a study in terror entitled Nightman on Suspense on the CBS Radio Network. 590 WROW, Albany, New York.